Um, honestly, some Sundays I just want to keep on singing because it is it is necessary. For one, God is worthy and God deserves all of our prayer and praise, but it just fills our hearts, amen? And that's what we need because this world does not worship Jesus Christ. They worship themselves. The government worships themselves. That's why you cannot believe anything really the government tells you. You only believe what the word of God tells you alone, amen? You don't, you don't, you don't, trust in experts. The expert is the Holy Spirit. It's the Word of God itself, and that's what we need to dive into. And today it's about prayer, gratitude, and worship. And before you you start thinking, okay, I, I know where this is going to go, or I've heard a lot of messages about prayer, about worship, about gratitude, and especially because we're entering Thanksgiving time, well, this may be a message very different than what you're used uh, to hearing about these subjects. Number one, how many of you before you go to the grocery store, do you pray about what you're going to purchase? Do you pray about your trip to Costco or your trip to school? Do you, do you pray about the people you know on a regular basis you're going to talk to through the week? Do you pray about those conversations? Do you pray about when you're going before you talk to your spouse or to your children? Do you pray about decisions that even bills that you do have the money to cover their normal bills, do you pray about those and in gratitude to God, or you just pray about the debts that are too big for you that you can't afford, you, you can't cover? So those you're going to pray for, but the ones that, that are sort of small bills, and, and I definitely have the money to cover those, those I don't need to pray for. That, that is how we think as human beings. We, we go to crisis mode, and if if there's a huge crisis in our life and God intervenes and answers our prayers, then we're quick to, to go to gratitude because we, we're so thankful. We were desperate. Now we're so relieved. But in, in, in many things during a normal week or a normal month, we don't have that attitude of gratitude. It's just not there. We, we say, Lord, thank you for the food, sometimes three times a day, and that's where it stays. It doesn't go beyond that. But to truly live a victorious life in Jesus Christ, there must be a spirit of prayer every day of our lives. That that is the way we think. That's the way our modus operandi. That's how we live our lives. And it's so easy when everything is going our way or going in a routine, we, we set in an autopilot and we do not engage really the spirit of the living God. We may do our devotionals every morning, we may not be in some horrific sin, but life is just the normal routine for us. And we go into the status quo, and when we live like that, you need to know something. You're actually slowly dying. You're not living life. You're not experiencing the abundant life that Jesus Christ promised because we, we are not living in that spirit of prayer. And each of us are called to live like that as believers in Jesus Christ. That's not just the super spiritual, the ones that are always in church. They are to live like that because, man, they're, they're the example. But we don't find that in Scripture. Yes, there's amazing examples in Scripture, and that we're going to look at one of them this morning. But we need to understand that our culture doesn't, and even our churches do not teach what it really means to walk in the Spirit like someone like George Mueller did, that prayed for everything whether the tiniest thing or the biggest need to feed hundreds of orphans, he was always in a spirit of prayer. And as Americans, we're not good at that. Because I want to know that I dominate my career, I dominate whatever situation I'm confronted with, I can manage it on my own because I am an American. Not only that, I'm a Christian American, so even more so, I have a power in and of myself. You need to know something about our American culture. American churches, American leaders are some of the most arrogant people in the entire world. And the more you travel internationally, the more you see that are humbled and even ashamed by it. Because when you're with people that truly know the gospel and they suffer, they're under constant threat of danger or the narcos are everywhere, there, there's a level of humility in the, of the brevity of life that we do not have in our culture. When, when we're in Via Vicencio, and you know that a little bit outside of the city is where they tortured 
foreigners and missionaries, and, and you know that you're sitting there at the table, and, and we're just talking about in, in the city and then outside the city. Ten years ago, uh, that's where they captured American missionaries and pulled their fingernails out and their eyebrows out and then killed them. And you're sitting there. You sort of really don't have an appetite when they're talking about that, the Colombians. And they're talking about all these other nationals, foreign nationals. Oh, yeah, that's where the military planes used to come in when they do all their negotiations. I'm like, yeah, I don't have an appetite right now. And they're like just eating away. And Isaiah is too. I'm like thinking, wow, it just hit me, the severity of what has happened in our world and how we take for granted so many things in this country and our churches. We don't have that really understanding of the awesomeness of God and the spiritual world. We're much more scientific than we are spiritual. Majority of American believers, evangelicals, are much more scientific. They always go to science first, and very rarely will they go to prayer first. They don't have that spirit of prayer because it's not part of evangelicalism. Do you all understand that? It's just not there. Well, how do you know? You're one person. I, I grew up as a pastor's kid. I've been around it all my life, from Bible colleges, seminaries, conferences galore, to working with churches of 13,000 members, to churches with 100 members. It is not there. How do you know it's not there? Easy. We have prayer services or prayer meetings once a week. Or Sunday morning, there's a prayer time, and that's our prayer time during the week. Does that show dichotomy, or does that show a spirit of prayer? Because if, if prayer service is Tuesday night, what does that tell you? That prayer is delegated to a certain two hours or one and a half hours every week. That's my prayer time, right? But in a church that believes in prayer is constantly praying. It's not just, oh yeah, I'm a prayer warrior because I, I'm, I'm faithful every Tuesday night at seven o'clock or every Sunday morning at eight o'clock, I'm always there for prayer. So I did my deed. I'm faithful to the prayer meetings, but the rest of the week, I just go along with the status quo. I follow along with my routine. And I just don't want anything to mess up that routine or even my, my devotional time. But how quick are you when everything is normal in your day? Nothing major is going on. There's no major crisis that's happening. But how many of you during the normal, typical day, and you have the time, you know your schedule during during the day, about what needs to get done or where you need to go, and you simply, even though you may pray little prayers here and there in the morning, you simply just break the routine, you stop, drop on your knees, and just cry out to God for his presence and his peace and his work and the building of his kingdom. How many times do you actually just do that? Where you just pull off the side of the road, you stop your car, and you just cry out to God. It doesn't matter if everyone sees you doing that. Like, what is that guy doing? But you live in that way where you get a prayer request for someone and you stop what you're doing and you just pray. The Holy Spirit intervenes at that moment, doesn't he? But again, that's not part of usually the way we think in our evangelical culture, which is, which is very sad to say because there is a major disconnect. So, Here's what we're going to learn in this sermon. If there is not a spirit of prayer, there's not true gratitude. If there's not true gratitude, there's not true worship. You have to have the spirit of prayer because it opens your eyes up to the greatness of God around you. Otherwise, if you don't have that spirit of prayer, you're going to think when everything works out okay and everything works out well, you're just going to think and assume what? Oh, that was good. Oh, I'm glad that it was a great week. Humanism, right? oh, I'm glad I got all my work done and got all my bills paid. Um, all these events went really well. But there's no worship there. It's like, oh, I guess I'm pretty smart, right? I made some really good decisions. Um, God blessed my work. We can even say that. But get to the point of saying, to the point of a heart of gratitude and worship, Lord, all I have is because of you. There's, there's Col Columbia would have gone bad without the prayers of God's people. I'm convinced of that. Colombia is not a safe country, right? Or do you, do you all think, oh yeah, that's, it was like Jerry was going to Hawaii because he was not a safe country. So 
so many things would not turn out like they do if it was not for prayer. How many of you would be dying right now or be dead because of bad cells in your body or some disease or your child dead? But God stopped it through the power of prayer. When I came home from work in Nicaragua, and Tiny goes, look at Gabby's leg. It looks like she has some kind of allergic reaction. And I saw that little red line starting, and I rushed her to the hospital. Uh, you know, major blood infection. But the church started praying. Otherwise, the doctor said that would have gone right up to, to her kidneys, right up to her organs. There is a power in prayer, not because it's prayer as a religious discipline. It's because of the God who is behind those prayers. Because he fulfills his word. He completes his promises. How many times does Jesus say, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. And we say, you know what? I don't really know if I believe that because so many things I've prayed for, God has not answered. (laughs) But the main, main caveat the main condition of that is you must abide in Christ and must obey his word. Because if you're not doing that, you don't even know what you're praying. Yes, I do. I know exactly what I need. I know exactly what I'm praying for. But if you don't know God's word, if you don't study God's word, you really, really don't know what you're praying for. That's the truth. You may be praying for 20 minutes and saying a lot of beautiful evangelical words, but you don't really know what you're praying for. The Puritans talked a lot about this. When we don't pray with our full heart, God doesn't respond. The spirit of prayer means that you are praying with your heart, your mind, and your soul. You are praying with your whole being. And if that is true, and I think of someone like Martin Luther, and all the spiritual warfare and and Satan, as he said, breathing down his neck, when you're in those intense battles, and you are waging war on your knees, those prayers are going to be passionate prayers, aren't they? Because you are in warfare. There are angels and demons fighting above your head for the souls of man, for the souls of your children. Instead, we think, oh, if I send my kids to Christian school, they're going to grow up, and probably, most likely, I'm pretty sure, maybe 90% sure that they're going to be followers of Christ. Wow, that's pretty bad theology, isn't it? Really bad theology. Well, I'm just going to make sure my kids are involved in Awana. I'm going to make sure that they're always in church. I'm going to make sure that they're always memorizing scripture. Well, that's, that's the best thing. But even in all that, how many Christian, we could say, kids that came from Christian families that have so many Bible verses memorized, and at, right now at 18, 19, 21 years of age, 25, 30, want nothing to do with God? In our churches, we have spent millions, if not billions of dollars on our youth groups. Yet the majority of youth could care less about Jesus Christ. You know why, church? It's because we have not cried out to God for the souls of our young people. How about not have so much money invested in youth group and have your own special youth pastor, which I've never been a fan of. And how about the church gets on their knees and cries out and fast for the young people's souls. And for those little children at five years of age, that God would protect them from the wiles of the enemy. How about that? That both parents and the church as a whole is dedicated wholeheartedly, praying and even fasting for the souls of our children. That is the power of God. In Luke 2, 36 through 38, at the time of a lot of miracles, Jesus being born, you have Zachariah and Elizabeth, um, parents of John the Baptist, yeah, a lot older, similar to Abraham and Sarah. Then you have Simeon, a godly man in the temple, as Mary and Jesus, um, as Mary, Joseph, and Jesus come to the temple for the dedication. And there in verse 36 of chapter 2, 
The word of God says this, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now we have to understand something right off the bat that the word prophet is here for Anna. There's only one other mentioned in the New Testament, but this could have more likely meant that her explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to explain what, why I'm saying that and why she was communicating, what she was communicating to the people that were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem, clarifying the word of God to those people um, is what most likely was taking place. Here's what's amazing about the prophetess Anna. The daughter of Phanuel, uh, the tribe of Asher. Is that important? Yes, it is. In Deuteronomy, Moses prophesies that for the tribe of Asher, and he prays this, your strength will equal your days. Your strength will equal your days. This is an elderly woman at the temple continually, extremely active in the service and worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many theologians put her age at 105 because the Greek syntax is a bit strange. So if she married at age 14, which was the common age, she would have been widowed at age 21. And then meet, it meets the young family, meets Jesus at 84 years later, which would put her at around 104 or 105 years of age. This lady has incredible strength. She has spent most of her entire life in and around the temple or close to the temple in some kind of apartment or dwelling place. And she dedicated her entire life to the spirit of prayer, worship, and fasting. And, and the word for worship is the same as serving. This lady, this prophetess Anna, shows us what it means to live in a spirit of prayer and fasting. And at such an older age, she is continuing and she is rewarded with seeing Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah, right in front of her eyes. How many years did it take for her to receive that blessing, the greatest gift in the universe? 84 plus years of faithfully crying out to God for the redemption of his people. And God answers the prayer of her at the moment she probably least expected, the same with Simeon, older people like Elizabeth and Zacharias, at the end, God reveals his plan and his purpose. And going back to the example of George Mueller, some of you may have already known this, maybe not, but the five of his friends that were unsaved, at the end of George Mueller's life, three of them came to Christ before he passed away. And after George Mueller died, this, the last two came to Christ. A man faithful in prayer, praying for the souls of his friends, and God answered that prayer during his life and after his life. See, the spiritual disciplines are not magical in and of themselves. There are some supposedly believers that worship the spiritual disciplines, don't they? They think as long as I have all these disciplines and I go to five Bible studies every week, I'm pleasing to God. No, you just don't understand the gospel. You are a moralist. But you do not truly trust in the blood of Jesus Christ alone. Because those Bible studies, going to church, giving offering, listening to MacArthur, listening to, to strict, strong, exegetical messages, does that save you? Reading all the commentaries of Calvin, does that save you from your sins? And hearing that, you automatically respond, oh, of course not. But how many people actually believe that in their heart? That is my salvation when that has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God and man alone, amen? He alone died on the cross of Calvary and rose again on the third day to redeem you and I from our sins. The spiritual disciplines don't save us, but they do in obedience to God's word, open the floodgates of God's blessings for your life and my life. 
and, and we don't say, Lord, I'm going to do this, this, and this because I want something from you. We know that we're in a spirit of prayer. God is changing us. And when God changes me, I pray for a lot of different things that I wouldn't otherwise pray for. Amen? If God didn't change me, I wouldn't care about praying for meekness in my life. If the gospel, the law of God didn't expose impatience in my life, that that's not like Jesus Christ, then I would have no desire and conviction to pray for true patience, that of Jesus, in my life. The law of God reveals that, amen? It exposes my heart and to know what to pray for. Because otherwise, I'd pray for a lot of selfish things, wouldn't I? Just like I'm sure you do. We, we want to pray, God, bless my kids. I want my kids happy. I want them to do good in school. I want them to do good in sports. I want them to have good friends. Okay, th- there's nothing wrong with praying those things. But are you praying that your children suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's like, well, no, because I'm not a parent masochist. But when we don't have true theology, we're not going to pray the true things, the biblical things, we don't ever, we're going to be a helicopter mom and dad. I don't ever want my kids to suffer anything. I don't want them ever suffer rejection, betrayal, attacks, being bullied from other kids at school. Well, guess what? Have you ever thought maybe your kid needed to be bullied at school? Because the mom's like, I'm going to take that kid out. When he comes out of school, I'm going to hit him with my, the book bag. He said, moms don't talk like that. Yes, they do. You don't know moms. I'm going to talk to that mom when I see her and tell her what her little boy's doing to my boy. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there's some people in our church actually would have those conversations. Not that you don't, you don't want to have those conversations. Sometimes they're necessary. But we want to protect our kids from everything. Instead of realizing, honey, you need to go on your knees and ask God. You need to learn what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ now. I can't be your savior. I'm not talking about the three-year-olds. Okay, he's like, man, he's extreme. He's like, he's just a five-year-old. What, is, what does he know? He's just, all he cares about is juicy juice and his snacks. And you're like saying he's got to be a super, you know, hero of the faith. But as that child grows up, he needs to know what it means to live by faith, and that is the spirit of prayer. If not, you give the child no good gifts. You could live, leave $2 million in the, in the inheritance fund. But if you don't teach your child to live by faith like the prophetess Anna did, you give your child nothing. You give your child an empty life. See, when I think like this, like I, I, I'm a firm believer that you cannot be a prayer warrior unless you truly believe in Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. I really do. It's like, Pastor Jared, how is that connected? Because look at David's heart. Look at how many times he mentions the word of God. It's all through that chapter that everything has to do with bathing yourself in the word of God to bathe everything in prayer. Because if I don't know Psalm 119, and we're just going to go read it. Psalm, we're going to read the whole chapter, okay? I'm just kidding. This is so, so critical for us to know that King David honestly fulfilled, fulfilled John 15, 1 through 11. He truly knew what it meant to abide in Christ. Psalm 119, 57 through 56 says this, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I sought your favor with all my heart. With all your what? All my heart. Be gracious to me according to your what? Your word, I consider my ways and turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten, did not delay, to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight, I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. I, ha- I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your, what? Precepts. The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Wow. Do you see what it means to abide in the word of God? Do you see what it means to pray according to the word of God? Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. And Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. How many of you love the book of Acts? Love the book of Acts. 
I mean, as I mention any book of the Bible, would be like, yeah, yeah. Mention Leviticus, people are like, uh, I'm not quite sure. But it's still the word of God. When you see in the book of Acts, like Acts 1.14, all the disciples were together with the women, devoted to prayer. Chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit. They were all gathered together. This Holy Spirit came, fell upon them. You see that all through the book of Acts, being devoted to prayer. And what happened when they were devoted to prayer and the presence, the filling of the Holy Spirit, they were bold in their witness of Jesus Christ. Don't you see that example in the prophetess Anna? Life of prayer, fasting, worship and service. And when Jesus Christ came to be dedicated to the temple, she testified to the glory of the salvation, not just of Israel, not just of Jerusalem, but of the world. That was her mission. As an elderly lady of about 104, 105 years of age, she testified about Jesus Christ. And you can imagine if she went back to her little apartment right next to the Temple Mount on the side probably because women weren't really allowed there, especially at night. Can you imagine her going back to her bed? Because we don't know anything about her after this verse 38. Can you imagine her laying her, her head on the pillow and saying, all my life, and singing that song, the goodness of God, all my life. I've seen the goodness of God, and then her breathing her last breath, going into an eternity. My eyes have seen the Savior, the living God. Can you imagine that she thought laying on her bed as she was going to breathe her last thing, oh man, what a wasted life I have. I spent all my life worshiping, serving, fasting, and in, and in great intercession and prayer. Would she have gone her last breath and thought those thoughts? But how many men, even supposedly Christian men, are on their deathbed and regret all the time I spent at my business instead of spending time with my kids. All the times I was worried about my 401k and my kids' inheritance instead of leaving them the gift of faith. I know only the Holy Spirit can do that. Don't start, you know, debating my theology because that's what people in Bozeman like to do. But here's the point is that you will never regret spending your life saying, I could go make more money. Proverbs tells me to desist and do not long to make more money. And I can spend my days crying out for the souls of my children, for the souls of their future spouses, for the kingdom's growth, and in his local church, and saying, Lord, I may not be very successful in the world's eyes. This woman, a widower, she's a widower, she's female, not that very important in Israel's culture and society. Pretty low status. But she made her life a life of prayer. She was dedicated to the most simple, not the most complex. You and I, we want to achieve what is complex because if we can achieve some kind of victory over that which is complex, we love that glory that it brings ourselves. Oh, oh, it's so hard to be a doctor, so hard to be a PhD, so hard to raise a company from zero and now make multi-millions of dollars in profit that is so complex, so difficult, so challenging, requires so much sacrifice. Yeah, and so what? Because you chose the complex. You chose to sacrifice, 1 Samuel 15, 22, over obedience. And now you lost all your rewards in heaven. Your crown may, maybe is a crown, maybe it's there, but it is empty and has no jewels in it. Because you chose this world, you chose evangelicalism instead of choosing Jesus. Our evangelical culture in America is so corrupt. 
fact that we idolize and worship stewardship over Jesus Christ is amazing. If I'm the good church member and I have all my money managed well, everyone in church is going to emulate and everyone in church is going to be what? Thinking, wow, you're so godly. Charles Ryrie, I think, I don't remember when, if it was the late 80s or early 90s, wrote a book called The Balanced Christian Life. Charles Ryrie, even though he wrote, you know, the Ryrie Study Bible, not the greatest theologian in some ways. He was a little bit too more Armenian for my taste. But that book, The Balanced Christian Life, I want to ask you about that. Is there anything balanced in the Apostle Paul's life? He's had rocks being thrown at him. He's being beaten. He's being whipped 40 times minus one. Do you say, you look at the Apostle Paul, you look at his whole life and the viewpoint, the filter of American evangelicalism. You look at the Apostle Paul and think, wow, is he a balanced man? His 401k, totally lined up. Portfolio, excellent. God's blessing is on him because he has $500,000 in the bank account. He's got his golf membership. He's been to Hawaii 10 times. He's got everything laid out for his future and his children. He serves in the local church. He's been there for 20 years. He's a pretty balanced, godly man, right? That, that's what we emulate. Right? God's blessing is on that man. Wow, he, he's a very successful businessman. So you know what we're going to do as a church? We're going to make him an elder. Really, has, has he fulfilled the requirements of being an elder, to be a hospitable, and he's always inviting people to his home? Oh, no, no, because that's not part of American culture, because we have hotels. So he's never invited, he doesn't have people over his house a lot? Oh, he doesn't? No, I don't think he ever does. Even though his house is like 7,000 square feet. Oh, okay, so, so what you're saying is he's not qualified to be an elder. Oh, yes, because he's, he's really successful. God's really blessed him, so obviously he's a godly man. Hmm, okay. Because what I see is he's not qualified to be an elder. But, but in American culture, that hospitality thing in there, that's just sort of, we just ignore that part because that's not really a priority for our churches. But once again, my question to each and every one of you is, did the Apostle Paul, did any of the apostles live a balanced Christian life? I've got my little devotional time, got my work time, got my family time, got my church time. I got it all planned out. Do you think Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he was going to be executed, think, wow, I'm so thankful I lived a balanced Christian life? Do you think Polycarp, when he was about to be burned at the stake, thought, man, I'm just so thankful that my life was so balanced and that I didn't go from one extreme to another? Pretty much being a follower of Jesus Christ is being pretty radical, isn't it? It's pretty extreme. A lot of extreme examples in the Bible that we can read, that we can talk about with each other, and to know that much of what you, what causes you, let's put it this way, that causes you sorrow in your life or discouragement is because you are setting yourself up for failure, comparing yourself with other Christians in the church with Facebook, Instagram, or what they say that may not be even true, think, man, how come I don't have God's blessing in my life like they do? How come I don't do and get to do or, or enjoy life like they supposedly enjoy life? For one, you don't know if they're enjoying life. They probably aren't. And because we make those comparisons, we get so discouraged because our eyes are on the wrong things entirely. May we not pursue happiness, amen? May we not pursue being fulfilled in the Christian life. May we not pursue this or that or the other. May we pursue simply the obedience to God's word and what it says. And when God chooses to bring that joy and those rewards, and just like the prophetess Anna experienced, let God make that choice, okay? Not us trying to fill those needs and satisfy our own hearts because when you try to sell, make yourself happy, does it work? What about, what about when you get married and you try to have a great marriage and that's your focus? Does that work? 
What about your kids? Like, my marriage doesn't make me that happy, but my kids surely will. Does that work? None of that works. Because our life is not about being happy. It's about being holy. Unless we open up our hearts and lives to walk in those disciplines and have a total, as Romans 12, 1 and 2, to be a living sacrifice, I need to have a renewal of my mind. Amen? How many of you in the last two weeks have thanked the Lord? I'll use the better example of during the summer when it's, when it's pretty hot out and you have an ice cold drink. How many of you actually pray before you take that drink saying, thank you, Lord, that I have ice? How many, when you come to church, say, thank you, Lord, that we have a seat to sit on? That when it's minus 20, that we have a roof overhead and the heater's like, you're actually sitting there and you feel the heat from the heaters coming in, especially if we turn that one on. Holy cow. <clears throat> that just blasts everyone out of here with the heat and the noise. But the side heaters are working. How many of you just sit before service begins saying, thank you, Lord, that there's heat? And, and maybe this is because I've been too long overseas. Like when you go, this is, I don't mean to be demeaning or, or gross or anything, but it, it, it's the practical reality of the goodness of God. How many times do you guys or anyone go into a restroom and saying, or, or into our bathrooms and just say, thank you, Lord, there's toilet paper. Because a lot of times you're traveling, there's nothing there. You're like, And, and the first year here living in Bozeman, I, so many times I'd turn on the shower and the water would come out. And I would say, wow, thank you, Lord. And, and, it, and it didn't shut off the entire time. But after a year living here, guess what? I stopped praying that. I got used to the fact that the electricity always stays on, that the water always comes out of the faucet. Man, that, and it was like, man, after a year, it's sort of boring here. Think, are you weird? When you don't have electricity for six months and you're using all the water out of baby pools in five gallon buckets, life becomes more adventurous. And you appreciate the little things. And you say, Thank you, Lord. When that water, the electricity comes back on after who knows how long a week, and the water comes back on after two days of having no water. Just seeing the water come out of the faucet, you're like, like, hallelujah. And yet, we don't get to go to Hawaii. We don't get to go to Fiji. Sorry, Jolene. And it sinks us. Because, because typical Americans, well, I, my friend just went back to Hawaii for the fifth time. I, I deserve to go at least once. No, you don't. You don't deserve the life and the breath that you have right now. You don't deserve to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't deserve the fact that you have a Bible in your language when thousands of dialects are still do not have the Word of God in their language. You and I don't deserve anything. Oh, well, we deserve our government to be godly and not corrupt. You don't see that in Scripture. There's only one kingdom with one ruler, with one perfect political dictator, and that is Jesus Christ. There is no other government as him. This, this attitude of walking in prayer, and, and if you look at John 15, 1 through 11, right? And everyone knows that passage. You should have it pretty much memorized. If you do not abide in Jesus, Jesus says you can do nothing. As Americans, do we like to hear that? Does that grate against our nerves? It really does. We can do nothing apart from abiding in Jesus Christ. That means doing what? Praying and walking, obeying in his commands. And and Jesus is so clear to abide in the love of the Father and that the love which the Father loves you is the same love that he loves me with. Isn't that amazing to think about? That the very love that God the Father loves his son, Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, is the same love that God the Father loves you with. So he doesn't love Jesus Christ huge 100% in perfection of of divinity inside the Trinity and you, ah, 
about 20%. You know, uh, this group over here, 30%. Oh, you, you've prayed a lot and you've been faithful. You're older. Okay, I'm going to love you 65, 70%. No. God loves you with 100% the same love by which he loves his own son. Does that not make you feel incredibly special as a daughter or son of the living God? Because it should. And if that is so, if you understand truly the, uh, the theology of the adoption of the sons of God, of us that have been born again, you will want and know and learn how to live in a life of spirit of prayer. And when you do, it's when your eyes open up and you become grateful and worship the Lord on everything. But when I don't have that spirit of prayer, I'm just following along with my routine. I've got everything under my control. Everything's going well. That's when I don't pray. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I do my devotional times. I pray for the list. I do those things. And when someone asks me to pray, yep, I pray for you. I pray for that, that, that list. But my life is not marked by life of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to wait for Sunday morning church. I'll just wait for that prayer meeting. I'll wait for a small group to, to get spiritual again. It's not going to happen. Because I'm not walking in the truth of God every day of my life. And so church, please right now pull out this little insert in your bulletin. Because tomorrow marks 40 days that we are going to be praying and fasting and that fasting is for Wednesday, 8 to 5, during the lunch hour, for those who are able to. And we're going to be praying for these lists for Petra Bozeman, for Nicaragua, and Colombia. We're going to be praying that God's work is done in among us and that we would see the supernatural workings of God among us. And if we truly take this commitment serious, we will see God definitely move in the ministry, amen? How many of you believe that? He will move here. He will move in Colombia and Nicaragua and other ministries, people, and other churches that we'll be praying for. But first and foremost, God is going to be moving inside your heart, amen? God's going to expose some things. Pastor Jared will... Let's talk about fasting a little bit. And, and this is, we don't have the time to do a message entirely on fasting. But is fasting and prayer, and I, and I want you to do this, is that when you fast and pray, if you have the time to dedicate, like even on a Wednesday at lunchtime, I want to ask you to have the word of God open in front of you as you pray. And that may be Ephesians 1, maybe Ephesians 3, the, the prayers of the Apostle Paul, but have those prayers open Read the prayers of Paul, and then do what? Pray the prayers of Paul. Pray what Jesus prayed. You know, I'll be honest with you, I'm not an emotional guy, except Sunday morning sometimes. But reading John 17, the high priestly prayer, the longest prayer of Jesus, it's hard to read that sometimes. Because you see a depth of the love of Jesus that you don't see to the potency in that chapter. Read John 17 and then pray what Jesus prayed. It will change you. You will not be the same person after you do that. Have the word of God open because fasting and prayer has much more to do with changing you than it does with getting what you want. So pray God does that work in your heart. Pray what Paul prays for the Ephesian or Colossian believers. Pray those kind of prayers. That, that's right theology. And then after that time happens, that time passes, pray for whatever needs God places on your hearts. And when that happens in that order, you are going to find, and I'm not trying to be super spiritual or emotionalism, but you will enter in to a deeper, more spirit-filled time of prayer when that happens. You will sense the presence of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way that you didn't the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes of prayer. 
Now, before you think, man, I think he's going Pentecostal on me. I'm not sure where he's going. How many of you have experienced that? Raise your hand. It's amazing. The Holy Spirit sort of takes takes over your prayers, right? So it's like, wow, I didn't I didn't realize that I needed to pray for that person that way. And then you call that person and like, oh, holy cow. That's why I was praying that. I, I had no idea. Let me pray for you on the phone right now. And that person is ministered to by the Holy Spirit, right? Because you were in the time of prayer, you were faithful in that, and God used you to be a blessing to other people. What happens when we do these kind of 40 days of prayer and fasting is, is something similar to John 3.30. We begin to decrease so that Christ increases. If I don't walk in the spiritual disciplines, automatically, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want all of you to look up here, please. When I don't do this and focus on the word of God and have the daily renewal of my mind, I automatically, without even trying, I automatically start growing and exalting myself. It's my desires, my wishes, my opinions, my viewpoints, my needs, and I no longer become a servant like prophetess Anna was. Because I'm consumed with my own thoughts and emotions. They control me. I'm in bondage to them. Where the word of God and obeying God's word frees me from my greatest enemy. And my greatest enemy is not other people. It's me. It always has been, always will be. And Jesus Christ and his power sets us free from ourselves. So that whole idea of the American dream, that's the idea of complete, total, 100% bondage. This is not about sacrificing living for other people. It's about my American dream, my comfort zone, my kids, my money, and my Dave Ramsey classes. Will that guy have rewards in heaven? Who knows? I don't know. God's the judge. If we don't steward God's kingdom well, that's our own hearts, right? That's the local church. We're never, I don't think God is going to care about how we stewarded money because our hearts are already corrupt. Right? It's already there. God sees you can't, you can't serve two masters. It, it, it's impossible. And so are, are we going to spend the, the next 40 days and, and the 40th day is the last day of December and then ending uh and starting New Year's, the new year would be 41. But I, I want to ask you all to pray through this entire holiday time, to be in a spirit of prayer. And especially at, at New Year's at midnight, that you dedicate the next year to the Lord. And though you could have a long list to, to pray for in that time, I want to ask you at that time to open up the Word of God and pray the Word of God. And saying, Lord, may this be fulfilled in my life. Because up to me, I want things my way. I have a lot of selfish prayer requests. But it's your word that matters. And that I need to pray according to your word. And so, for example, just to throw this out, the idea of spiritual disciplines. New Year's Eve. Read Psalm 119. Read the entire chapter. And you might, some of you might fall asleep. I don't know. But read the entire chapter and say, Lord, may I live according to your precepts. Because if not, I'm going to go my own way and it's going to be bad. I'm going to hurt myself. I'm going to hurt a lot of people. I'm going to defame you, rob you of your glory. I don't want 2022 to be about me. And my little American dream. I want it to be about you and your glory, but I know myself so well that I'm so quick to leave the God I love. How many of you of us have walked in the Holy Spirit, in the filling of the Holy Spirit, and then one phone call? Something someone does in the house that just sets you off. And, and, and going back, using the example, a lot of George Mueller, 
he even said that the humbling nature of Christianity that he'd get up off of a time of solitude and prayer off of his knees and then get in an argument with his wife and lose it all. Praise God for his honesty, amen? How quickly we leave the God we love. That's who we are. If not for the grace of God wooing us back into his presence, we would never stay. Oh, yes, I would. I love Jesus. I am so godly. No, you're not. Because if the Apostle Paul said he's the chief of all sinners, you're definitely a big chief. And so am I. So that's the reality of our human depravity. Amen. Our heart is so prone to wickedness and evil and to say things. How, How many of you have been so completely surprised of things that have come out of your mouth? Only Pastor Nick. (laughs) Which shows that if we don't guard our tongues through prayer and we don't pray ahead of time, we can say some pretty horrible things. And do you all know, I I don't want to assume anything, do you all know what I mean by a spirit of prayer? Or is that a new term, a new phrase for you? And what that means is that And just remember it this way, that you and I bathe everything in prayer. Whatever conversation, whatever activity that you're going to do, that that 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul saying pray without ceasing, that doesn't mean like closing your eyes and trying not to run into things because you're praying or trying to do that when you're driving, which would be really wow. It means that you are constantly Searching out God's will, not your own. Not just when there's a crisis or you have a huge debt that you have to pay off and you don't know how. But that you have the mindset of Christ. That if Jesus Christ himself walked in these spiritual disciplines, as Hebrews says, learned obedience through what he suffered, went to the mountains to be alone and pray, how much more you and I need to do that? We have a lot of mountains around us, right? And sometimes we don't go there enough. We don't seek the Lord by ourselves in the mountains. And I'm telling you, that's one of the best things you could do. Well, it seems so lazy. I mean, I have so much work to do. I have so many things to do. No. It's stopping that routine and saying, Lord, I'm not going to worship my routine. I'm going to worship you. I'm not going to worship my to-do list. How many of you have to-do list? Pastor Nick and I. How many Americans worship their to-do list? And if they, if they complete that to-do list by Friday, wow, God's blessing me. Wow, I love being a Christian. But if they don't complete that to-do list, that's how we are. People worship their to-do list. They worship their activities. God is a jealous God, brothers and sisters in Christ. This 40-day prayer challenge, really, is nothing compared to what Jesus Christ has done for us. Absolutely nothing. Remember when Jesus talked about in Luke 17, the unworthy servant, you've only done that which was required, right? The call to prayer and praying according to God's word is the purpose, the divine calling for your life and mine. It's not just the prophetess Anna, which, by the way, in Hebrew is Hannah. Isn't that cool? I love the story of Hannah. Now we have Anna, Old Testament, New Testament. See the bridge, see the connections. Jesus Christ is in the Old and the New Testament. Pretty amazing. That's why every believer should love the Old Testament, right? Love it. It's God's word. It's amazing. It bridges those two covenants together. Samuel, now Jesus, Hannah, crying out to God in prayer. At the temple steps, the priest thought she was drunk. Pretty powerful prayer warrior, right? Praying with a lot of emotion. How many of us are bad, bad prayers? We don't pray well. We don't pray with our full heart and our soul. 
If your child's about to die of a sickness, moms, are you going to cry out with everything in your being for God's healing of your child? Now, all of other prayer requests may not be that intense. But if you want to see family and friends come to Christ and not go to spend an eternity in hell, you're going to passionately plead for their salvation, aren't you? Now, I, in a way, humble confession, I really lost a lot of hope for Tanya's brother and just more annoyed and aggravated. I mean, and after 20 years of doing the same rebellion and causing the same amount of suffering to the entire family, but Tanya was more and more fervent in her prayer for her salvation. And now he's walking with Christ to this day. Adoniram Judson praying for his brother's salvation. He left the dock in the East Coast to Burma, knowing his brother was going to hell. And after he lost his wife, one or two of his children, in a deep, deep depression, remember the word came that your brother has died. And it broke Adam Niram Judson's depression because he also heard the news your brother received Christ before his death. Adam Niram Judson did not, was not the American, typical American evangelical. He did not put his family first. He put Christ first, and God honored his family. You do not think that Tanya choosing to be a missionary in Africa and in Nicaragua has anything to do with her brother's salvation. Do you? Because you certainly see precedent of it in scripture and in church history. But leaving someone that criticizes you and attacks you and calls you and cusses you out because you're leaving the family to the mission field, pretty hard to take, isn't it? What Adoniram Judson's brother said to him on the dock when he was leaving probably wasn't very kind. We don't know. It comes to the point of asking yourself, do I truly want to live a life of faith or no? It took steps of faith for me to go to Colombia in even those situations with things that I'm not going to talk about. There's not time. The difference was, is that I, would, I was going with Isaiah with the prayers of God's people. Do you think I would have gone on that plane without the prayers of God's people? No, because I have enough experience to know what it means. You don't go until God moves. The warfare is way beyond <clears throat> our pay scale. We must depend and cry out to the Lord in faithful intercession. And church, you know uh, I'm a firm believer that we don't just come to church to play church. But if you truly believe that God is calling you to this 40 days, that it's from your heart, not just because we're doing it as a church. But I want you to make a stand saying, Lord, I am weak in my own. But by faith, you are going to do a work in my heart and life. That I will bathe, I will learn. I will learn because we need to learn to bathe everything in prayer. Whether everything's going great or everything's going terrible. I'm not going to rest back. And trust myself and fall into temptation because I will. I'm going to spend the holidays more in intercession. Because the enemy is going to keep attacking. He's not going to stop. Some of you may not know what I'm about to say. In December, on average, about 33,000 Americans commit suicide every year. A lot of spiritual warfare, right? Not much praying going on because there's a lot of turkey and gifts going on. Not a lot of intercession. And people are sorrowful and they're suffering. So if you believe that this is God's calling on your life, that you want to live and learn what it's like, what it means to follow Christ in this way, please stand up at this moment. Please stand up and saying, Lord, it's, it's not my strength, it's not my power, it's yours. And that God wants action, but he wants the right action. Amen. God wants obedience and not sacrifice. 
And so as I pray over all of you, I want you to pray in your own hearts for this next 40 days that God's protection, for God's strength, for God's wisdom and discernment, and that God will use the prayers of his people. And that, that as you are praying, Jesus is going to intercede for you and bring those prayers, his own prayers, before the Heavenly Father. Isn't that amazing to think about? So as I pray for all of you, please pray in your own hearts for these next 40 days. Dear Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for the examples of Hannah and 1 Samuel. Thank you, Lord, for the prophetess Anna in Luke chapter 2. Lord, amazing. They're examples, Lord Jesus. And that you put those examples there for our instruction. That we may learn what it means to live the Christian life. And Lord, I personally have failed far too many times to count. Assuming that everything's going to be okay. Instead of faithfully interceding and bathing everything in prayer. Lord, we pray for each one of these people that have committed to these next 40 days of prayer. That, Lord Jesus, you would guide them, you would guard them from the attacks and the lies of the enemy. That you would help them to open up the word of God and read what it says and follow what it is instructing us to do, even though we're so weak and fragile. Lord, give us the power to live victorious, abundant Christian lives. Help us, Lord Jesus, to walk in your precepts, to live according to your word, to abide by your promises, to be strengthened, Lord Jesus, by your instructions. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our king, that there is no one on this earth like you, that you are the name above all other names, that you are the first and the last, the omega, the great I am. You are king of kings and lord of lords. What a privilege we have to bring everything to you in prayer at any moment, at any time. And that will usher in a heart of rich gratitude and worship, Lord Jesus. This is what I pray for our church. This is what I pray for our hearts, for Colombia and for Nicaragua, Lord. I pray that your spirit would do amazing, powerful work. That you would build your kingdom upon the entire earth, Lord. That Jesus Christ alone will receive all glory, praise, and honor. Because you alone are worthy of it, Jesus. There is nothing like you. You are the most beautiful person in the entire universe, Jesus. And we long to stay in your temple. May we long to gaze at your beauty. And may that be our treasure in the richness of Christ Jesus in our lives, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray these things, Father, knowing that you, as Ephesians 3.20 says, Lord Jesus, can do far more exceedingly beyond what we could ever think or imagine. Thank you, Jesus, for your promises. <clears throat> we give you this time, Lord. We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you that your spirit is here. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for watching Petra Bible Church Bozeman. We will have a new sermon uploaded each week for both English and Spanish services. And remember, hit like and subscribe. Thank you and God bless.